Well, good morning, everybody. You know, whether you're here for the first time or the 400th, I want to tell you it's just an honor to spend part of my Labor Day weekend with you today. It's funny, we're in a series about a guy who lived about 3,100 years ago. His name was Samuel. And people will tell you that one of his nicknames was Kingmaker because he anointed the first two kings of Israel. Others will say that uh, he is well known as uh, the last judge and the first prophet in the nation of Israel. But I guess as I started looking ahead to this protect, particular series, I should say it's kind of funny because Kingmaker is ending today and we haven't even got to Samuel's birth. So let me give you a bit of a spoiler alert. We're gonna be with Samuel for a while. And we're transitioning into a new series next week Um, because up till now we've kind of got to the point of Samuel's birth and then we're gonna start talking about his life next week. But as I look back in March at what we should be talking about uh, now, I was thinking that there's, there's one thing that really stands out to me about Samuel and that's how much he has in common with you. And I want to explain that because I think that comes across at times a little bit glib and a little bit catchphrasy. So, so let me explain what I mean when I say that. I really believe that uh, God's word is the Bible. And you think about the billions of stories that have played out throughout history. God chose a select number of men and a select number of women, a select number of stories to feature in his word, the Bible. And, and I believe he placed them there because they're exemplary. In other words, there's a timelessness to them. So we, we, we look at the principles in the lives of the people in the Bible, specifically now I'm talking about Samuel, and I would suggest to you that those principles are as real today as they were 3,100 years ago. And so he has lo- lots in common with you. N- number one, not too many people know too much about Samuel. That's a little bit like you and me. Now, I know there's some kind of famous people that go to this church, but in the scope of history, not too many people know too much about you. And and yet, I would tell you that Samuel was an extraordinary person, and so are you. You're not normal. You're not cookie cutter. You're not average. You're extraordinary, just like Samuel was. See, God had a plan for Samuel. God has a plan for you. God had a purpose for Samuel. God has a purpose for you. Like God's writing this story on the pages of history and the story is called redemption. And the way that he writes it is is he writes redemption on your life and then he uses your life to tell his story. So I want to take and I I I want to use the life of Samuel as an inspiration to tell our story called redemption. So up till now what we've learned is that Samuel's dad and mom, Elkanah and Hannah, they go to a town called Shiloh. Shiloh was the religious center of Israel at this time. And they go there to worship God on a spiritual retreat. And during their time at Shiloh, uh, Hannah goes to the temple and she's praying that God would allow her to have a child. Uh, Up until that point of her life, Hannah was childless. And in that culture, that was a big deal. She was really asking God, you know, would you please allow me to have a child. And what's interesting when you read the Bible, you gotta understand, when you read about Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter one, verse nine, uh, you gotta realize that Hannah wasn't able to read on later in the chapter and realize, oh, it's fine, Hannah, you're gonna have a son named Samuel. At that point, she was just going on faith and she's praying, she's praying so passionately, in fact, that there's a priest there at the temple, a priest named Eli, who walks up to her and says, are you drunk? You know, he even says to her, uh, put away your wine which I thought was funny last week and you didn't, and I think it's funny again this week and also you don't. People say that to you all the time. Put away your wine, you know? Uh, I lost my train of thought completely. And she says, I'm not drunk. I'm just praying, you know? 
I'm praying in faith, I'm, I'm praying passionately that God would allow me to have a child. And, and so we pick up the story there. Eli answered, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord, and then they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in, the, in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel. For she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. Then the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, as soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. So there's a theme that's emerging so far in the story of Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter one, and that theme is worship. That theme is worship. Or like Elkanah and Hannah go to Shiloh to worship the Lord. Hannah prays, e- Eli prays for her also, and before she's even conceived her son, she worships God in gratitude. And then Samuel is born, and Hannah, in, in, in perhaps the greatest act of worship that anyone could ever have, she dedicates her son completely and totally to the Lord. That's worship. Reminds me a, of a passage in the New Testament uh, written by the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of God in Romans chapter one, or sorry, chapter 12, verse one. This is what he says about worship. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Eugene Peterson paraphrases that passage in in, in the message. He says this, here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. You'll be changed from the inside out. Worship. Worship. We worship God when we give him our voice in song. We worship God when we give... Uh, when we give him our hands to help. We, we worship God when we give our time and our treasure and our talents. But mostly, according to Romans 12, and I would suggest to you the entire Bible, we really worship God when we give him us. When you just give him you. When I just give him me. That's worship. And you see something really profound play out here in 1 Samuel chapter one because Hannah takes it to the next level. She takes it to a generational level. She dedicates her son completely and totally to God. And I wanna suggest to you that that's a move that every one of us needs to make. I got a video that I wanna show today that I hope illustrates that just a little bit. So if the team could push play, that'd be great. So, yeah, we can celebrate that. But let me tell you something that you already know. There are gonna be times that you really wanna be there for your kids, but you can't, but God can. There are gonna be answers that you simply don't have for your son or your daughter, but God has those answers. There are gonna be times that even when you're there, your son or your daughter is gonna feel completely and totally alone. But God is gonna let them know that he is an ever-present help in times even of trouble. I wanna stop there for a second because I really believe, and I I I wanna reiterate to you, this is a big deal. This job, (laughs) it's too big for you on your own. You need to invite God in. You need to dedicate your son or your daughter to God. But now let me take it one step further because you might be toning out thinking, oh, I'm not a parent, it doesn't apply to me. I would suggest to you that it absolutely, totally does. If you're single here today, I wanna remind you, Hannah worshiped the Lord before Samuel was even conceived. Dedicate your children to the Lord right now. 
If you're an aunt or an uncle here today, okay, you play an important role. If you are a Southside youth leader here today, you play an important role. If you are a kids church, a Southside kids volunteer, you play an important role. If you're an older brother or an older sister, you play an important role. I guess what I'm really getting to is this. We've been talking all series long about the fact that God has given me, has given you a great story to tell. I wanna let you know something. The power of your story, the impact of your story, will be largely determined by the impact that you make on the next generation. the ability that you have to leave this world a better place than how you found it will be largely determined by the love that you show, by the inspiration you give to the generations that come after you. This applies to you. If if, if this is your church, if if, if you wanna write a great, tell a great story with your life, this applies to you. And it's weird because I think about our culture and there's a lie that our culture, I I think, has been believing. And that lie is the concept of a generation gap or generation gaps. It's an illusion. And we're living it. It's a lie and for so many, what that lie becomes, it becomes an excuse to live a selfish life. Generation gaps. They're, they're, they're a lie. And, and what generation gaps do is this, they put us in an adversarial position, an adversarial stance against the very generation that we're called to impact. Do you understand what I'm saying? And it starts right away. You got 20 year olds that are walking around with their friends and they're saying things like this. Oh man, oh man, the kids in high school nowadays, man, they're sure not as cool as we were when we were in high school. Well, yeah, they probably are. You know, you weren't that cool when you were in high school, but it's a, gen- no, you know, it, but it's a generation gap. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? And all of a sudden, because if you're 20, you should really be investing in and making an impact on some 16, 17-year-olds. Or t- 25-year-olds walking around going, man, like the Jonas Brothers? That was cool music. When, hey, when we were kids and we were, now that's a cool band. Now, nowadays, these kids li- listen to garbage. Well, the Jonas Brothers aren't that great, you know what I mean? Like, but, 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 but you see what happens. It's this subtle lie that, 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 that we believe. It's this illusion that we live, the generation gap, and all of a sudden, there's this ad- us, us, and them, us, and them, and it's a problem. 32-year-olds walking around going, greatest movie of all time, the trash that they put out nowadays, the greatest movie ever, Dumb and Dumber, honestly. Now, that was a cool movie. No, it, it wasn't, you know? Like, the name is true. Like, the name really fits. But you buy it, and now you got this little tribe, and it's us, and it's my generation, and it's them, and, and, and all of a sudden, we're living this lie, and it, all it is, really, is an excuse to be selfish. It's an excuse, an excuse not to leave this world better than how we found it. The other day I was adding up how many people I've spoke to in my life in all my years of leadership, teaching and coaching and do, you know, speaking at camps and retreats, chapel services and church services and um, weddings. And, and, I, and, I, and I figure throughout the years of my leadership so far, I, I, sp- I spoke to about 1.5 million people. And I think, man, I, I hope somewhere along the line I gave them a little hope. I hope somewhere along the line I gave him a little inspiration. Gave him a, a little challenge, maybe some information, you know? But here's what I want you to hear me say today. 1.5 million people, and yet there are six people in my life, okay, that, 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 that if I wanna give hope, if I wanna give inspiration, if I wanna give information, if I wanna give challenge, these six people, man, they, 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 they honestly, they, they're, they're the priority. And their names are Tori, Lucas, Emma, Gabe, Bedza, Samuel. My ability to leave this world better than I found it will be largely determined by the impact, the hope that I bring to those six. It's a big deal. I was reading the other day how in the United States, 150 churches close every week. 
close their doors. In Canada, 20 churches across Canada close their doors every week. And I honestly, I, I can't give you every reason why every one of those churches closes, but I can give you one reason why many of them close. It's the lie called the generation gap. It's us versus them. So what happens is a church starts at some point. Maybe it starts with a bunch of young whippersnappers, like 30-year-olds, they seem young to me, you know? So you're like, those are old, they're ancient. No, they're not, just shut up, okay? So, so let's, say, let's say a group of 30-year-olds start a church, right? And, and they're cutting edge and it's awesome and it's cool and then they get a little older and they turn 40, but they still think that they have every answer. They still think that they're relevant. Well, you're 40 now, man, and, and then you're 45, and then you're 50, and the whole church grows up, and what happens, listen, what can end up happening to some churches is that um, th- th- they confuse message with methods. See, the message that God has given us is the message of the gospel, okay? But the methods, like we'll do anything, you know this about our church, we'll do anything short of sin to tell the message of Jesus to every five-year-old, 10-year-old, 15-year-old, 20-year-old, 75-year-old, we'll, we'll do that. But what can happen in some churches that experience this generation gap is they started, you know, we laugh at the churches that say, man, they, they still think the pipe organ is the best instrument, but it can happen to every church. And all of a sudden, the methods that we used 15 years ago, we think that those are sacred. No, the message is sacred. This isn't just for parents. This is for every aunt, every uncle, every grandparent, every Southside youth leader, every Southside kids volunteer, for every single one of us. You want to leave this world better than you found it? You want to make the impact that you were born to make? You must invest in the next generation. And I really believe that in order to do that, we need to invite God in, you know, live a life of worship. And inspire them to do the same because when they do, they'll be changed from the inside out. They'll be changed from the inside out. We talked about it last week, like who you are matters more than what you do. Man, I, I, I want the next gen. I want, I want our five-year-olds to know. I want our 10-year-olds to know. I, I want our 15-year-olds to know. I want our 21 year old snow. I want, I want them to know that you were created on purpose, with a purpose, for a purpose, by a God who does not make mistakes. The youth just came out with these shirts, you know? And on the back, they say uh, purpose, 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 purpose. I asked them, can I have one? They said no. And I said, can I wear one on Sunday? And they said, maybe. So I just took it and I'm wearing it now. But, but <laughs> and, and, shameless plug, youth kicks off this week. Be there. It's gonna be amazing. But I want them to know that there's a, they have a heavenly father who created them in his image. They're extraordinary. They're extraordinary. And that Jesus stepped into human history to restore whatever this broken world has robbed from them, to renew that image bearer of God's status in their life. And, 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 and the Holy Spirit has empowered them I know we keep talking about it all series long, but I want to remind you again, what's true for you is true for them. That that, that God has given them, real them, a redemption story to tell. And here's the thing, when they get in touch with the life of worship, when they see God, when they know what God really believes about them, what God really sees in them, that that story, they'll just tell it. And, and, And it doesn't really matter what they do because it's gonna emanate from who they are. I don't care if my kids are CEOs. I don't care if they play in the NBA. I don't care if they're lawyers or doctors or preachers or teachers or missionaries or or fast food employees. I don't care. But I care with everything inside of me that they will always know who they are. And this generational gap, it's destructive. The very people that are supposed to be reminding them over and over and over again, purpose, 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 extraordinary, loved, empowered, the very people that's supposed to be passing that on to the next generation, all of a sudden we're adversarial? And we spend so much time judging or or trying trying to define for them what they do that we forget to remind them who they are. A little while ago, I read this uh, autobiography 
uh, written by a tennis player named Andre Agassi. Uh, tennis used to be a really cool sport, by the way. Uh, a while ago, back, back in the day, I'm speaking of generation gaps, you know, but uh, <laughs> Andre Agassi was good. He, he ascended all the way to number one, number one ranked tennis player in the world. He won eight majors. The girls all thought Andre Agassi was really good looking, by the way. I got a picture of him. You can decide for yourself, okay? Um, it's coming in a second. That's me. Okay, there, there he is. <laughs> That's Andre. So he, he made hundreds of millions of dollars in tennis and endorsements. The interesting thing about him is that from the time that he was t- a toddler, his dad would make him play tennis for hours and hours and hours and hours a day. So I'm reading through this book, and at the, at the height of his success, at the height of his number one world ranking, this is what he wrote. I hate tennis. I hate it with a dark, secret passion, and I always have. I hate tennis. I hate it with all my heart. And still I keep playing, keep hitting all morning and all afternoon because I have no choice. No matter how much I want to stop, I don't. I keep begging myself to stop, and still I keep playing, and this gap, this contradiction between what I want to do and what I actually do feels like the core of my life. You say, well, yeah, but I mean, he made hundreds of millions of dollars and he was like number one ranked in the world and I say, who cares? See, so often, we're, you know, we're in this adversarial stance and we, we wanna focus on the outside in. What do you look like? What are you doing? Jesus said it this way, what does it profit a person to gain the whole world but lose their soul? Man, I wanna invest in this next generation. I wanna inspire them to a life of worship so that they always remember that who they are at the core is more important than maybe a mistake that they made along the way or what, or what they do. I think the best way that you and I can inspire that next generation to live a life of worship is to live a life of worship ourselves. Dedicating that next generation to the Lord. And I think there's two ways we can do it. Number one, by what we do, and number two, by what we say. I think it's funny that I just said what we do because I've been talking for the last two weeks about who you are is more important than what you do. <laughs> it's funny though because your kids, the, 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 the youth that you lead, the kids that you lead, they only see who you are by what you do and what you say. What you do and what you say will be inspired by who you are. So here's my question for you. Are you living a life of worship? Because if you are, you will be changed from the inside out. You know know what I didn't say to you attend church regularly? I didn't even say is your eternity secure. What I said is, are you living a life of worship? And according to Romans 12 and, and, and numerous passages in the Bible, life of worship says you give him what? You. You give him you. Complete and total trust. You know, it's that, it, it, it's that disciple, the disciple's prayer. Jesus, take me, redeem me, and use redeem me to bring redemption to this world, to this next generation. That's it, take me, redeem me, use redeem me to bring redemption to this world. When you do that, you'll be changed from the inside out. Jesus said it this way, they're gonna know that you're my disciples by your love. Love. 1 Corinthians 13 says love is patient, are you? Are you patient? I say that because I'm not. A couple years ago I got up here and I told you that a doctor had told me uh, that I was chemically incapable of patience. <laughs> and I really like that. Like I thought that was a great excuse and then about six months ago God said, no it's not okay to be impatient, you need to be patient. And I'm becoming more patient and it's one of the most painful things that I've ever done. It's been tough. Redeem me and use redeem me to bring redemption to the next generation. Love is patient, are you? Love is kind, are you? Are you becoming more kind? Not just to them, but do they see you being kind, that next generation? Because they're watching. Love doesn't envy and it doesn't boast. It's not rude or proud. Are you humble? 
quick test to see if you're humble. Uh, when's the last time you said thank you? Humble people are grateful for lots of things. Arrogant people are not thankful. Are you humble? When's the last time you said sorry? Because anytime you have a disagreement with somebody, especially someone in the next generation, you can probably always find something that you could have done better, right? Arrogant people don't say sorry. Do you? Love is not self-seeking. In other words, love is generous. Are you generous? <laughs> are you generous with friends and family? Or are you the guy at the restaurant or the girl at the restaurant that's always like, man, you're not going to believe it again. I just, I forgot my wallet. <laughs> You're generous when you, when, you, when you tip waiters and waitresses. The next generation is watching. You're generous with your church? Here's the thing about the next generation, especially if they come here, they, they walk into this church and they hear every single week about stories about how God is changing this city, changing history, one life, one story at a time. It's tough though, right? What do they say, that the last, per, the last thing to get saved is your wallet? You ever hear that one? It's tough. Um, love is not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrong. Are you forgiving or are you bitter? Are you becoming more forgiving? Or you just hang on to stuff, right? And just love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices in the truth. Do you call out and gravitate to the positive, or are you like a moth to the flame with the negative? Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. See, I think we do have an inspiring generation here that is leading a good example to that next generation because there's some tenacity that I think we have at Southside when it comes to our marriages. Tenacity, I like that word, tenacity. Faithfulness. See, I'm not suggesting that, you know what, if you want to leave this world better than you find it, if you want to make an impact on the next generation, you've got to live perfectly. No, what, what, I, what I am suggesting is you've got to be changing. You've got to pray this prayer. Redeem me and use redeem me to bring redemption to the world. It's in what you do. It's in what you say. It's funny how some churches talk about what you, what you shouldn't say. You know, don't cuss and don't curse. I don't really know what the difference is between that. No barnyard, you know, don't, don't, don't talk like someone from Red Deer, in short, you know, like, and, and, and so it seems like churches t talk a lot about what you shouldn't say, but maybe we should spend just a little more time talking about how, how we should, how we should speak. Proverbs 10 says this, the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. Speak life. Speak life. Speak hope. Speak vision. Speak potential. See, it's, it's funny that generation gap. It's, it, it's a tough one, right? Because you have older people, older people now, they look at the millennials, they look at the next generation, Generation Z, they look at them and they say, well, how about that social media thing? Oh yeah, we got, hey, we got a whole generation just desperate for validation on social media. Just a, you know, just another like, just another follow. Weird, isn't it? Hmm. I read a survey the other day. I surveyed a bunch of young adults. They asked them two questions. Number one question Is your mom proud of you? Large majority said yes. Second question Is your dad proud of you? Large majority said no. Is your dad proud of you? Is your dad proud of you? No. That's the thing about this next generation, man. <laughs> Social media, they're just so desperate for validation. Is your dad proud of you? No. Oh, they, they need you. Speak life. Tell them about Jesus. That can get awkward, I would suggest to you. 
It's funny, I've had people say to me, well, it's easy for you because you're a pastor, you know, talking to your kids about, about God. Not really. You know, I, here's what I, 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 I don't call my kids into the li- living room and go, okay, everybody have a seat. Have a seat, everyone quiet. Okay, put your phones down. Hey, can, welcome to week four of Kingmaker, everybody. I'm so glad you could join us, Tori, Lucas, Evan, Gabe, Beds, and Samuel. It doesn't really work that way. But I had a friend that said something to me a while ago now. He said this. If something should be simple and easy, but it's all of a sudden difficult, that's a sign of a spiritual battle. Speak life. Speak hope. Speak about Jesus. It's it's weird because I have no problem. I, I, I coached most of my kids. I had no problem talking about physical stuff with them. Conditioning and running and strategy and tech. we never really often got to sportsmanship but but that you know the, we'll, 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 okay I, but that, w- that was never awkward for me or um you know talking about mind stuff you know like helping with their homework i was terrible at it but it was never really awkward i was just bad at it like when i would help my kids with math it was like traumatic for both of us they're doing algebra, and I, I, I'm just, I struggle at times with patience, okay? So I do, and I I'm, I'm really am. God's changing me, but, but, but at that time especially, I'm just like, oh, can't you just get this algebra thing? And so my technique was just to cheer and just, you got this! Algebra has nothing, and, and, and for some reason that didn't help, you know? It just made him nervous. Remember when I taught, when I tried to teach Tori how to drive standard? Everyone should know how to drive standard. If you ever get in the amazing race, you will automatically lose if you can't drive standard, okay? (laughs) So I'm like, okay, a little impatient, so I'm gonna teach Tori in one day how to drive standard. It's gonna be awesome, okay? So we drop Lucas off for school one morning, and we gotta drive from GW Graham to Sardis Secondary, and I figure, now, you know, now's as good a time as any. So I'm like, Tori, you're driving standard. We get out onto Vetter Road in school rush hour, and I'm cheering, you got this! But it didn't help, and she kept stalling the car out. And uh, so eventually I had to take over. She was traumatized. We went through Tim Hortons, and I got her a hot chocolate and a muffin. As far as I know, she's never driven a standard since then. <laughs> so what does this have to do with anything, Mike? Very little, but interesting stories, okay? So it's not awkward talking about uh, physical stuff. It's not awkward talking about like mental stuff or teaching them stuff, but, but when it comes to ta- talking about Jesus, the stakes are really high, and so you might face resistance. Push through. Tell them about heaven. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them about the gospel. Tell them about your story, where you were at, and, and the difference that Jesus has made in your life. The story that you tell with your life, your ability to leave this world better than how you found it will be largely determined by the impact that you make on the next generations. Don't believe this lie. They need you. They need me. Why don't you stand up? Let me pray for you. God, I thank you for every single person here today. I, I, I thank you for every young person, every middle-aged person, every, 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 every older, oldish person here, God. I do, I, I, I thank you that you've called us today with an opportunity to love those around us. And, and, and specifically, God, I pray that you would give us opportunities to inspire, to bring hope, to bring a picture of redemption and worship to the next generation. Redeem us and use redeemed us to bring redemption to this world. In your name, amen. God bless you guys, have a great week. Thanks for joining us. We'd love to see you at any of our three Sunday services held at Sardis Secondary School on Stevenson Road in Chilliwack, British Columbia. For more information, please visit southsidelife.com.